Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. Engagers, today we have somebody, as usual, very, very special, but because all the guests that we have here are amazing. But before we get started with you, Jolt, we need to know if you are prepared to engage. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Let's do this. So the first thing, of course, I try to, to do it as a decent pronunciation as I can. But as usual, it's just the best version that I can get. Is it, did I get it sort of right? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I listen to anything that's close to Jolt. So perfect. <laughs> fantastic. Fantastic. So it's a pleasure to have you here because Jolt is a creative learning consultant at Kineo with over 15 years of experience in L&D. He's also a frequent speaker at the learning conferences or the subject of engagement and game thinking in L&D. He was once, the, or actually twice, in the top 50 authors of the year in elearningindustry.com. And he's also published two years in a row. And he's also published a gameful book called Engage the War, War L&D, Exploring Six Essential Traits of Instructional Design. And he has a degree in information technology. And Jolt's been not only talking the game, but also walking the game with various workshops using game engines and sharing his prototypes online. And if you want to know something interesting as well, he used to have free time at some point. And at that time, he wrote a feature film screenplay that was a finalist in an international competition. So Jolt, is there anything that we're missing from that intro? Um, I, this is my shortest version. Um, <laughs> I tried to, <laughs> I tried to put them and, and by the way, so my book title, um, is it's confusing for everyone, but it's, it's, um, engage the world. So the world itself spelled with L and D in it, W O R L and D. And it's kind of like my, my slogan of the world is much bigger than our little bubble L and D. So when we engaging, we'll think about a lot of things outside of L and D. <laughs> It was difficult to convey in a in an audio format, but you did a beautiful job because I'm sure you've you've thought it through many times more than I could have. So <laughs> that was fantastic. But Jolt, there's something that we would like to know and that we like to to understand to help understand our guests. And and it, and that is, what does a regular day? And if you don't have a regular day, maybe a regular week. What does being Jolt look like in a, in the typical time frame? So I started the early, I have twins. Um, they're in teenage age now. This is when they hate us. So I just, you know, give them food and everything, <laughs> calm them down. Then I have a long commute down to my basement, about two minutes walk. And um, I, working from home, I work for Kineo. It's a global company. And so the um, actual HQ is in, in, um, in Chicago, but I'm in Philadelphia. So my day generally is online and um, all digital. So I use camera all the time to connect with people from all over the world, working with clients. And our projects generally focused around learning and uh, performance goals and business goals. Um, most of the time as a learning consultant, I do the work up front. So trying to figure out the problems. And I like to call this like creative digital problem solving um, all through the day. I do have lunch in the middle though. <laughs> Every once in a while we have to eat. <laughs> That's fantastic. That sounds very exciting. And having a work from home kind of setting is is absolutely right for many people. Some other people prefer having the whole office setting. But I think when you have that opportunity, it can be absolutely fantastic. So Jolt, we would like to get right into the, the the first subject, and that's one of the hard ones because we like to to show our, our our audience that even though people like you, like Jolt, who is in, in an absolute amazing place, who is in a, a speaker about L and D and engagement and game thinking, even though you are in that amazing place, you've also done things, tried things that didn't go exactly as you expected. So we would like you to tell us a story of. Perhaps what you would like to call something like your favorite fail or first attempt in learning. And of course, how did you come out of it if you did? Or what did you learn from it, which is always something super, super important from this kinds of experiences? Can you, can you tell us that story, Jolt? 
Um, there's so many of them, so I don't even know where to go. Um, <laughs> now, I, I do believe that you need to come up with lots of bad ideas to to have a good one. So we creative people don't just sit around and wait until someone tells us to, okay, be creative now. And so there's a lot of failure uh, in my life, definitely. So if I can um, talk about one quick one, it's about using the timer um, in games or gamification as an engagement element. Uh, my early on in my career, we created this cool, um, like a driving type of simulation scenario when agents have to figure out what the customers want and match it up, um, how they pay for their bills, etc. And we created this cool game around it. It was successful, but there was one problem with it, apparently, the timer. Um, back then, I had no idea that timer causes like heart attack, literally, from <laughs> <laughs> from the moment people see it on the screen. So now I know um, that one, and this is my number one advice if you ever want to use timer is, is look at what happens outside of your little game or gamification in the real world. So are these people are under time constraints when they do their work? If they are, then it's maybe a good thing to use the timer. If not, then don't use the timer because it's going to freak them out. And they're focusing on this flight or fight, um, you know, reaction rather than actually learning something. And even if you do use the timer, um, there are different ways to approach that. So, for example, it doesn't have to be the cool time is up, you failed type of approach. You can go up. And if they complete something within a time frame, then maybe you get bonus. Um, so instead of cutting them off is just if you're faster, you get maybe more points or more whatever uh, appreciation out of that. It's less dramatic than having a timer. And one last thing about timers is that it doesn't matter how much time you give them. If you give them like a hundred minutes, but there is a timer ticking, it's just the effect is there in, the, it's in, in their mind. It's just um, interesting to see how the, the reaction went. We changed the timer, we created a training version of it. And then once they were practicing without any timer, then they went into the um, the final one when you have two minutes to collect X amount of money in the game. And that worked uh, very well. Nice. That's fantastic. And very, very interesting lessons learned from that. And actually, I wanted to make a small follow-up question to that because I was, when you were telling your story, I was reflecting about the last time I, I had my students take a test. And of course, I even though I would like to be able to spend their three or four hours uh, hearing their questions and, and seeing how they can solve their tests, the tests uh, typically have a time constraint, whatever that, that constraint is. And at the moment you say, whatever time it is, I mean, I had to tell them that it was one and a half hours, but it, I could have told them it was three hours or 10. They would, I'm sure they would still have had that terror look in their faces because there is, as you mentioned, uh, a time constraint. So I don't know, because you were mentioning ways around it, like maybe not being so hard on it, but when you have situations in which even if you put the timer or not, you, you will have you know, the time running up and people know that the time is running up and they get anxious about it. Is there any sort of tip that you could give, uh, especially people that are in this learning and development or education, is there any tip to, to you know, reduce the anxiety around uh, the, the time left for people? So I think one thing is that it affects different people differently. So in, there's yes. a difference between education and a workplace because in education, um, I think people are like kids. I don't know. In, in Spain, it's the same as the, here, but um, they're more constrained and um, more regulations. And so they kind of get used to that there is everything is timed and they move on um, in, the, in the workplace, especially when you do it online. Um, when there's a timer ticking, it it feels like for some people, it might feel like there's someone is watching you, even if there's nothing like that. It's just <laughs> as like, okay, I can't even type uh, you know, freely because someone is watching. So with, with people who have anxiety, especially, like my, my daughter, for example, she hates um, timers. Um, she had this exercise, uh, math online, and after five minutes, she said, okay, I'm done, I made it. And I said, how much time left? 25 minutes. It's like you did it in five minutes and there's 25 left and you and you worry about it. Um, so it's kind of hard, but I think for, for education, it's I think the preparation part of it to understand um, the practice part before you even get to the, the task that they have to have their own kind of internal timer and focusing on what they're doing and how they're doing rather than and, you know, watching the time because it's not going to speed them up just because they know there's a timer ticking. <laughs> I completely, completely agree and concur. So thank you for, for all that advice, especially for 
um, especially again for for teachers, for professors in universities, business schools, and so on that have these kind of restraints. I mean, we there, there's nothing we can do about it, even though maybe some of us would wish we could have a little bit more time. We try to de- we design our, our tests to be completed in that time frame, but even if some people will finish early, those you can see the the faces of that same people when you say the amount of time they have going like crazy. So, thank you for for that advice. And turning it around, uh, Jolt, I would like to know of a story that instead of going for that dark place, that difficult failure where you learned a lot, I would like to go for something that actually went the way you expected, something that was a, a big challenge that you faced and you solved using using, using the principles that you've learned from games, with, with game thinking, gamification, engagement, and so on. So let's uh, stick to time then. Time is strange, but uh, flip, <laughs> it, flip it upside down. Um, often we work on the time constraints. Like uh, we need to create something for yesterday, and we don't. We know that we could create something great and more effective and more science-based and whatever that is if we had time and resources. But we don't. So this example in a call center, we need to set up a whole call center for taking calls. These agents have been uh, handpicked. They were very good at selling um, cable and TV and all that, but they were brand new to uh, wireless. So they have no idea about the product. They have no idea how to sell it, but in a month, they have to start taking calls. And so we created the curriculum from nothing because there was no previous example uh, with that. And one of the things that, that we had to work with is the wireless company who came and kind of helped us to create um, their curriculum. So there was an IELT instructor-led training uh, a whole day. And previously, they need to take, or our agents need to tra- take this uh, learning about the product. Now, it was a PDF, like 80-page PDF that they need to read. And it was obvious that people are not going to learn from reading PDFs. So what we created, it created two groups, created a trivia Again, it was like a week time frame, quick trivia um, that kind of measured what they learned knowledge wise and a little bit of a skill um, about the product and selling based on this PDF. So the two groups went through that. Then the next step was for each group to create their own trivia questions that they can challenge the other team the next day. And this was, I think, the best um, step or design that we ever um, that because we didn't have to do the job. We just facilitated the conversation. And for hours, it was a great teamwork of figuring out what is the best question to ask, how to ask questions, uh, what part of the content is the best to ask about so they wouldn't know the answer, that type of thing. So they created their their own trivia version. We plugged those questions in. The next day, um, each team took each other's questions and see where they landed at the end. After these two days, what they didn't know is that we we actually collected all this information in the back end. And when the ILT started, um, the instructional training and this wireless trainer came over, we actually handed over the statistics of here are the categories, the questions we asked. This is what people really know. So you don't have to st- spend time on it. And here's a lot of things that they have absolutely no idea about. So maybe this is this where you should do my hands on exercise, that type of thing. So the, the, the original idea of here's a PDF, read it, and you kind of like magically um, remembers and understand these things, that just was not working. That's that's how we included some of the game thinking and and uh, and, and game gamification in between game thinking and gamification. Um, as a result, I think it worked well. <laughs> Even if you give them a timer, they won't read the 80 pages and remember everything magically. <laughs> <laughs> and we used the timer because we uh, wanted to do some extra, you know, uh, fun with that. So they, they were complaining about the timer, definitely. <laughs> It made sense in this context. And again, I want to remind yep. many of the engagers that might be listening that not always there, there's been some talk in gamification about the, the good and the bad of, of points, badges and leaderboards. That doesn't mean that points, badges and or leaderboards are good or bad by themselves. The question is what you do with them. Same thing happens with a timer, as we can see in this example. A timer can be used well, well designed, well thought through for a certain audience under a certain circumstance and not used so well under another circumstance for a different audience. So always, I'd like to bring it back to that, thinking about who you're designing for, what you're designing for, what's your objective, what do you want to get? And there's where you actually make sense of whatever it is that you're creating. I don't know if you agree with me, Jolt. 
Absolutely. So this would not be a, a scalable version for like a whole year just doing um, extrinsic motivation of here's your points and badges. They would not go with that. It would not be effective. This time frame, and we knew that the next day is going to be an IoT with hands-on exercise with cell phones. Uh, the two work together because the next day come, basically came the intrinsic motivation. This is how I can know more about it. I could be a better um, person sales-wise and knowledge-wise. So the two work together, but it was a short time frame, quick, almost like a campaign style um, design. That sounds f absolutely fantastic, Jolt. So now I, I want to ask you about, because you've, you've told us about two times that you designed these type of, of short programs or even long programs. And I wanted to know if you have some sort of approach in general, like a, a, some sort of process or an approach that you do when you, when you face these challenges of L&D and you want to use game thinking, gamification. Do you have some steps? Do you, have, do you follow somebody else's process? What, what do you do when, you have, when, some, when a problem like this one comes to your, to your table? So I never start with game thinking, gamification, or game anything. That is part of already the, the, the design part. And before you get to that, there's a lot of things happen. A, I don't know if, if uh, you or your audience heard about Kathy Moore. Um, I'm a big fan of Kathy Moore's action mapping. So literally a process that we start before we even get to the design part or content or, or any game. Just think about what the business problem is, what people um, should be doing. So what are the goals, the performance goals is about actions and not know things or understand things, but what actions and decisions they need to take, um, you know, to reach that goal. And then what are the barriers that holds them back? And we do this exercise to figuring out what's, what is that holding back from that? So is it basically knowledge that they need? Is it a skill? Is it something that motivating? Um, so they know what to do. They don't know. They know what to do. They know how to do it. It's just not motivated to do that, or is some kind of an external thing like uh, technical stuff, like the software they're using is slow or that type of thing that's not really training. So all that information comes first to understand the situation, understand your users, because the people are going to make this happen. There's no technology, there's no gamification platform that's going to solve the problem unless we know what the real problem is and why people are not doing what they're doing. So that's all comes way before we get to um, game thinking. And once we know those problems, then we can see if it's a motivation problem, you design differently versus a, you know, a, a knowledge problem that you need to remember in the morning when they wake up versus they need to have a checklist somewhere that they can use. That those things uh, can be solved by training, by learning, by game thinking, but before that, again, it's I start with Kathy Moore's action mapping. Action mapping by Kathy Moore. That's a that that sounds like a very interesting one. I I don't know the framework in itself, but the the things that you were mentioning, I think, fit in very very well with everything. I mean, if if the project should be solved by game thinking or gamification, uh, or, or or another technique, I think the 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 most logical step, as you mentioned, is to understand what are you trying to achieve what are the barriers to get there and what's the problem that you're facing in general and how the and then is when you can actually think about how to overcome that problem if you don't know what's the barrier that you're facing if it's a wall that you need to climb or if it's you have to dig a tunnel um, you, you still don't know what are your what are the tools that you're going to need to to achieve such a goal so i completely agree with such a framework so that's that's very very interesting i'm, I'm going to look into kathy moore we'll We'll set it in the show notes. So, engagers, if if you're interested in knowing more about this, we'll 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 have a link to this information in the show notes to see what where we can find out more about Kathy Moore. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers, so we can change the world together through gamification. So, Jolt. There's uh, in this in this sort of second section of, of the podcast, we like to know things like, and that's the first question, if there's any sort of, I don't know, like best practice or, or any strategy or action that you, you think would be, uh, you know, something that would benefit most projects in this arena, in this area of game thinking and gamification. If there was one thing that you would say, well, use this, do this, what would that, what would that small bit uh, or of, of a larger picture, of course, what would you say that thing is? Um, so I think it's a segue from our previous uh, question about the people and uh, people make this happen and we were about problem solving is problem solving 
is a process where you need to understand two things or even more, but two definitely. Who are the people? Why are they not doing what they're doing? And what would motivate them to do what you want them to do? And we have to be authentic, figuring out what they really need to do on the job versus here's a game and we have content. So in that sense of what motivates people and how to use game mechanics, game elements to create that motivation, um, if you want to be fancy, you can say motivational affordances, or you can translate that into simple things that that people are people dif different people are motivated by different things. And what that means is that just because you love Pokemon Go, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to love your game if you build that game that looks like a lame, you know, Angry Bird or whatever that is. Um, you need to create something in the design that works well for different types of people with different motivational affordances. Um, and this is why leaderboards are not <clears throat> a valid solution for everyone. If you create a leaderboard, um, all the competitive people are going to be on top 10, which is great, but they were already competitive. And what's gonna, what are you going to do with the others who can, can see the leaderboard top? So they could basically, they get disengaged. So the one thing that I would, I would suggest is looking into what motivates people. And that's, that's a topic way outside, or you can be <laughs> go outside all the way from, uh, from, thinking and game thinking all the way to um, positive psychology, but think about it, different ways of using gaming elements and how they affect others. So one thing that I can mention is Andrzej Marczewski's user type um, approach. So at least think about um, several different types of users and their motivations and figuring out what you design um, is, is balanced enough with intrinsic motivation that people um, doing what they're doing because you help them to grow rather than just, you know, give them awards and points at the end. So it's all about users. It's all about users. I think that's the, the, the phrase that would sum it up your, your, your explanation there. And I love it. It's all about the users or the players, depending on how you want to, you want to see them. So Jolt, what would you say is your favorite game? It's kind of hard to compare genres to genres, but Civilization was one of the first big game that had an impact uh, on my life. I had a friend in college who didn't graduate because he wanted to see what the end of the Civilization game is. <laughs> and back then, you could either use Microsoft to play the game or use Windows to work. So he rather not was writing his dissertation, but uh, played the game. Um, but from board games, uh, Settlers of Catan, I love that. Um, from online games, uh, Minecraft is an interesting one because I love the creative world uh, type of approach and what they did it with education with it. And in terms of digital storytelling, Firewatch is an amazing um, game that it almost has this this um, atmosphere that I just I just love. Absolutely. So there you have quite a few recommendations, I think. Most of them can be gateways into into games and into that type of games. Maybe you haven't tested out or, or seen how how these work. Those are great recommendations. And and Jolt, after listening to most of these questions and and answering them yourself, what who would be a person that you would like to listen to answering these questions in in Professor Game? Uh, I have several ones. Call Cop. I don't know if you've been on the show yet. Um, he has great yes. books. So he's one, he was a good entertainer too. Um, he also wrote a book, co-wrote a book with Sharon Bowler, um, Play to Learn, which is uh, very uh, much to the, down to the level of in-social design and game design. So how in-social designers can use game design uh, to think differently and build games. So Sharon Bowler would be a good one. And if you want to be a little bit outside of game design, at least for now, and moving to more like uh, how to use game thinking to solve problems and how do you create products is Amy Jo Kim would be uh, a great one. She is absolutely fantastic as well. I've been I've been talking to her in, in recent days, and we we might come up with something interesting for for the engagers in the in the coming days. So so stay tuned to Amy Jo Kim as well. So Jolt. Now that you mentioned several, actually the, the three people that you mentioned, they're all authors. Is there, if you had to recommend a book to an audience like this one, like the, the Engagers, what book would you recommend? Um, so I'll go back to these people because Call It Cop, basically anything he wrote on gamification, field of gamification, examples, even his courses online, um, that's a good start. Um, he's really focused on the learning part of it. 
and not the sensational part, a psychology part, but more like in practical use, what do you do with this? And again, with Sharon Baller, they wrote, co-wrote this play to learn. It's based on a workshop that I also attended, um, a game design workshop a day and a half when you actually create a prototype, um, definitely. And actually, Amy Jo, jo Kim's book, um, Game Thinking, is I think it's available again on Amazon or, or somewhere. Yes. And this is more about how you learn all these best practices from gamification um, and game thinking and put it into practice when you, you know, want to create a new product, for example. Yeah, it's it's all about, uh, well, the, the Carl's books are phenomenal. I mean, he is he's certainly a, a massive figure and his books are very influential in the gamification, especially in the learning arena. And, and Amy Jo Kim is all about game thinking and how to apply game design principles to, to other things like creating products, especially because she's very dedicated in, 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 the, in the valley, so to speak, in San Francisco and, and the surroundings. So, Jolt, what would you say, now that we've listened to all of these recommendations that you have and all the great things that other people are doing, we would also like to know what would you consider is your superpower in, in, in this arena? What's your, your sweet spot? What's something that you, you feel that you do great in this, in this kind of designs? Um, so that I would say it's the fact that I don't um, like gamification. <laughs> so I'm not, and I'm, it's in a sense that I'm not married to gamification. So the word itself, I think, caused a lot of issue in the last couple of years uh, within our, our industry because L&D tend to grab these buzzwords and take basically like cherry picking the easiest part of uh, of something that they don't know much about and they run with it. And then they declare it dead after a couple of years because it's not working. So like, for example, if you go to a restaurant and you order a great meal, you don't go home and start blogging about that you're a cook. And I think we should use bacon in everything. Like you need to understand that in that meal, bacon played a role. And there's a lot of things about bacon in the kitchen that you've never seen. So instead of learning about how to cook and what bacon is good for, you say bacon is great to put it into smoothie. So that that I think this approach sometimes um, prevails in in L and D of people just grabbing these labels and run with them. So instead of of running with the label itself, I spent enough time in it and figuring out how in practical use we can use that, not just in theory but in in practical use. So my my superpower, um, if I have to name it, would be um, in gamification is that I I, I start with um, action mapping, start with real people and real problems, problem solving, and gamification could be a tool that I use, may or may not. So that's my my I superpower. I don't know if actually it's a superpower, but it's more like a normal power. Absolutely, a superpower, because you're, you're, you're skeptic in a good way, in the sense that you're not just jumping into the first thing. And I, I had never thought about it in that, in that way. One of the reasons why um, people say that gamification fails, and I, 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 do, I certainly don't have as much time in the field in L, of L and D to have seen that come and go. But that's a, a beautiful insight that you that you bring for 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 gamification, especially in in this arena of L and D. Because again, I had never thought of it that way. You're the first person, at least, to mention it on the podcast, and and to me even in person. I think that's a very interesting way to see why why some people declare things dead and and so on. I think thank you for for that that um that perspective as well. So maybe that's a superpower. The first <laughs> Absolutely. The first absolutely. <laughs> so Jolt, there's this certain uh question that we have in the podcast that is is we could almost say it's kind of gamified because it has this randomness element and it has all this social connection of people making their own questions and empowering them uh, and having all this ownership over, over making their own questions. And that, of course, means that they're interested in the answers that they're, they're getting from our guests who are very knowledgeable. And this one that we're going to get today is uh, from a person called Remco. So the question is quite simple um, and... I I would like to start it. It's it's very quick, and I would like to. Of course, I as you mentioned, you're not just into gamification. You're into L and D. But this person is asking, how did you start in gamification? So how how did this come to happen? How did this come to be a part of your of your work in in the learning and development industry? So in in my case, um, three things kind of came together 
and it wasn't in, in intentional, unintentional, um, and not by design, although I could claim it now. But back in the days, I always I was always into computers and the technology part. And that's how I got my degree in, in um, information technology slash engineering. But then after that, I realized after four years that, that I actually like people and more interested in talking to people than sitting in front of a computer for eight hours. So I did uh, another degree of teaching. So these two have been, uh, I think, my pillars. And the third one was just creativity, which is not like something that you learn generally. Um, in fact, I'm probably like addicted to that. So I'm, I'm just basically learning how to cope with creativity. But the three together is it, it was a powerful combination. We used uh, games in my family as I growing up every year, you know, extended family came together. I grew up behind the Iron Curtain and there was not much to do at that point because we have two channels on TV and both were state run. So you can imagine the excitement between <laughs> A and B. Um, and so we bought these um, board games for every Christmas and we played like whole year round and, and play with that cards, dice, everything in the world. And what I was starting learning is, is is less about, I was less excited about the games themselves, but their reactions and people and connections. And I think this is where good game design starts, not with the mechanics. It's easy to learn what the mechanics are. Uh, it's much harder to learn what the, the, the dynamics and aesthetics come when you put them together and the reaction from, from people. So start watching people playing games and interacting with each other, not only just physical games, but sport games. Uh, people change completely the moment they step on a pitch. And this is what you see in your design when you create something that's um, out of ordinary and not the traditional e-learning, put it in front of people and they get immersed. That state of mind is very different from the normal. And And if you don't understand how that works or you don't have enough play tests before then you get very interesting results because some people will hate it some love it and this is where it all comes down to cheek sent me high's flow of it's an easy concept of just enough challenge so you can do it and then raise it gradually but it's really hard to do that in practice so in my case i've been trying to do that for the last 20 years and i'm still there's still a lot to learn <laughs> still learning every single day and i'm i'm happy that you were the one who mentioned chicks chicks Mihaly. i always get that last name wrong because <laughs> you're, you're also hungarian so you probably are one of the few person in this podcast that has mentioned him that actually knows how to pronounce uh, his name yes yeah, so if i can uh, claim any fame i can pronounce chicks and Mihaly and spell it in <laughs> fact i actually uh, uh, read the flow in hungarian first and then in english so. wow <laughs> That's that's something absolutely unique, I think, at least from the people that have come. Yeah, not that not that actually makes me any better person, but <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So, Jolt, we're arriving to to the end of of the interview, and I would like to give you the chance to give us any any final piece of advice you would like to leave uh, the engagers with any any you know any piece of knowledge that you feel that that could be interesting for them. Of course, right after that, get into the plug zone and let us know what you're doing, where we can know more about you, more about your work, where are you on social media or, or wherever it is that you want to lead us so that we can communicate with you. And then, of course, we'll say that it's game over. So I think it's, to sum it up, gamification itself, you can think of it as a tool, um, just one of the tools in your toolkit to solve problems. The world is changing so fast in the last couple of years that everybody's talking about the you know fourth uh, revolution that's happening out there, the automation and AI and everything that's that's behind the scene changing how we live and work and get things done. That is a, such a fa fast paced process. Then you think that it's only a fact uh, factories and other places when there's automation um, that's going to be probably wrong very soon, even in your opinion, um, counts. But what happens is that it's going to affect every single person everywhere. So when you think about gamification as a as a tool, is just, again, one of the little things that you can do and apply. But in order to get there, you need to know, understand what the problem is, what people are involved, there's the authentic needs and goals, and all the circumstances around where they apply that. It's not a research project. When you people sit in a lab and they have time and no timer, 
and we watch <laughs> them, you know, learn something in the MRI and fMRI and all that. That is great. But when people go to work, there's ego, there's politics, there's there's all kinds of things in play. So not everybody's gonna love your gamified something uh, compliance training when it used to take them two minutes to get through now it takes 25 but they don't learn a thing so again it doesn't start with gamification it starts with audience authentic needs and goals and that's not a job that can be easily automated understanding people understanding their motivations and designing for that i i think that is one of the the jobs of the present and of the future so thank you very much, Jolt. Uh, you still haven't let us know where we can find you, where we can find out more about your projects, what you're doing, where are you in social media before we, we before we close it up? Uh, definitely. So I, again, I mentioned I work for Kineo. If you want to get things done, um, design and creative solutions, you can come to Kineo. Um, outside of Kineo, as a, as a person, I'm very active in social media. Um, Rabbit or Rag is, uh, there's a whole story behind it. It's probably the worst uh, website or name ever, but that it is. <laughs> so we'll probably have to have a visual for that. Um, so you find me on rabbitorag.com, also on Twitter at Rabbit or Rag, or LinkedIn. Uh, it's probably in Jolt Ola number one, which is um, easy to find. And conferences, uh, I love to share. And if you notice, you probably noticed my enthusiasm about this topic. Topic. So um, just shoot me an email, find me on social media, ask any questions. I love to help um, out with you to, um, to you know, share this enthusiasm and, and get like real results rather than just uh, writing blogs um, about the topic. Absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much. Uh, engagers, if you want to find this episode, the, the name Jolt is spelled Z or Z-S-O-L-T. So you just type that into the search bar and you'll get all the information that Jolt has been mentioning throughout the episode, where to find him, what is web, this webpage, rabbit or egg, and so on. So just uh, you can type that into the professorgame.com. You'll find the episode and get all of that information right in one place so you can find Jolt wherever he's at right now. Thanks again, Jolt. It was a pleasure to have you in Professor Game Podcast. I thank you very much for all the insights, all the information that we got, all the stories. However, now it's time to say that it's game over. Hey, Engagers, thank you for listening to Professor Game Podcast. I hope you really enjoyed this interview with Jolt. And I'd like to ask you, how are you listening to this podcast? And if it is through a podcasting app, and I know you've heard this in any other podcast that you're listening, because it really helps but have you subscribed and rated this podcast? Please do so. That way we can reach more engagers like you and achieve our mission of making learning amazing. If you have any doubts on how to do this, you can go to the instructions. We have something at professorgame.com slash iTunes, and there you'll have the instructions for a couple of softwares as well. So please, again, I know this is something that you've heard before, but it really does help to build a community to help other people like yourself that might be interested in the topic. So thank you very much. And if you want to know what's up next week, you will have to subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.